You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. It consists of a series of presentations by experts in allergy immunology and can serve as the didactic curriculum for trainees in the field. I hope you enjoy COLA. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, August 22nd. This is our second presentation for conferences online and allergy today. Um, we're fortunate to have Dr. Jade Tam Williams with us, uh, who's going to speak on the evaluation of severe asthma. Um, Dr. Tam Williams is an assistant professor and faculty in the Division of Allergy, Immunology, Pulmonary, and Sleep Medicine here at Children's Mercy, Kansas City. Uh, she completed her pulmonary fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis and then returned to KC to be part of the pulmonary section. She's uh, co-founder of the uh, Advanced Asthma Interdisciplinary Respiratory Clinic. We call it the AIR Clinic here, and that's where they focus on poorly controlled patients with severe asthma. Um, it's, it's a great clinic. It's staffed with pulmonologists, allergists, respiratory therapists, and uh, nurse coordinators, social workers, nutritionists, etc. So it's a great comprehensive program for our patients with the greatest needs. She's also a co-primary investigator for Children's Mercy Site for the Research Foundation for Children with Interstitial Lung Disease. So with that, Dr. Tam Williams, if you don't mind, we'll hand it over to you today. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to do this talk. Very few times do I get to do something where I get to like kind of nerd out a little bit. So. Um, so we'll start with our disclosure. So first off, I, uh, I'm a pediatric pulmonologist. So that's, I think, a pretty important part. I, I mainly see kids and I really just think about lungs. Um, from the way I view life, um, I'm pretty skeptical of one size fits all approaches. And I think a lot about what's practical, what's real life versus what's my ideal life and what's my research life. And I think that kind of may uh, code the way, um, you know, how I present my talk. So. We've got, these are my objectives today. The big thing that I'm going to really focus on is diagnostic testing examples. Um, you know, I was thinking about how do I do this talk for a lot of allergists, and I thought, okay, when I'm in air clinic, what do I really provide? I mean, my allergist kind of knows how to manage asthma. She knows how to manage allergy. So, like, what, what am I there for, right? And I realized I'm there to make sure that of the other stuff. Um, so we're going to talk through some of those and then very briefly review treatment options. I almost always start with this slide. And um, the reason why I start with this slide is because um, in my fellowship, I remember one of my mentors, uh, Jim Kemp, he was 70 years old, and he looked at me dead in the eye one day and said, Jade, the more I think about asthma, the less I know what the hell it is. And that is why I always go back to this definition. So what is asthma? It's chronic, it's airway hyperresponsitive, it has to be lower airway obstruction, has to be partially reversible, and inflammation has to be present. The things that make it difficult, like this little picture shows uh, to the six blind men with the elephant um, story, is that it's got a variety of stimuli, the diversity of its clinical presentation, the variability of its clinical course. For this talk, we're really going to be focusing on just the severes. Um, and most of you have seen something like this table where we classify severity by um, their symptoms, how often they wake up, you know, how much they use their albuterol, and how uh, limited their lung function is. What we realize is that these are the minority of patients out there, but yet they account for most of the morbidity, most of the mortality and the healthcare costs. It's estimated in 2019, a study came out that estimated a new one of up to 10% of adults and maybe 2.5% of children, um, but yet they still use over 50% of the healthcare costs. And they're oftentimes the patients that require the most out of us. In 2014, the ATS and ERS guidelines came out. Um, ATS and ERS came out with guidelines on severe asthma, and they tried to define severe asthma. So um, this is specifically for those over the age of six. And what they said was they has to be at step four and step five. So the high dose ICS with a LABA or an LTRA 
or systemic steroids for more than 50% of the year. And they had to be uncontrolled. And they defined uncontrolled by either what they reported on their asthma control test, how the frequency of their severe exacerbation or the seriousness of their severe ex exacerbation or how much airflow limitation there was. They also put in the caveat that, well, it could also be, you know, controlled asthma that got worse when they tapered. Now, Gina most recently also provided some definitions, which I wanted to include here. Um, and this is, these are from the Gina Severe Asthma Pocket Guide. Um, and they define um, uncontrolled versus difficult to treat versus severe. So uncontrolled is essentially poor symptom control, the way we think about what uncontrolled is. But uncontrolled could be a flow event 110 kid that's uncontrolled, right? Um, a difficult to treat asthmatic had to be on step four and step five and still uncontrolled. So and they made a caveat that said that their difficulty to treat um, could be due to modifiable risk factors or simply the diagnosis was incorrect. Um, and then finally, the last group is, again, the severe asthmatics. And this was a subset of difficult to treat. And so if you look at this little table, this is from adults with asthma from a Dutch population survey. And they said out of 100, 24% were on step four and step five. Out of that, 17% had difficult to treat. And out of that group, only 3.7% was um, actually severe asthma. So this talk is really about what's the evaluation process to severe asthma, and I broke it down to six steps. It's super easy. It's not hard at all. Um, the first one is just to confirm the diagnosis. Um, the second is to identify the comorbidities. What are modifiable risk factors? Then to address those modifiable risk factors and then optimize the management. And then you assess for phenotype. After assessing for phenotype, you can then consider add-on therapies and whether you're a type 2 or not a type 2. And then we, again, go back, address and optimize management. And at each point of the asterisk, your job is to reassess, reassess, and reassess and make sure you're doing the right thing. So let's start with the chief complaint of severe asthma. The first question that I entreat you to ask yourself whenever you see the words referral for severe asthma or referral for difficult to treat asthma, the first thing, first, first thing that should run through your head is, is this actually asthma? Right. So that's so it's easy to believe what others have diagnosed. It's harder to really question those things. So I know you guys are going to have lots of talks on asthma. Um, and so I wanted to just briefly touch upon the things that sort of are my what I call ding dings like, OK, that's weird um, when I look at a history or a physical. Um, and so these are my personal things um, that as soon as I see this, I start talking or hearing about this, I start thinking, is this, is this all asthma or is this asthma and, or is this not asthma at all? Um, so first of all, I always ask about prematurity and the neonatal experience. One, because extreme prematurity, I know those children have small airways hyperreactivity. And then the other thing is I always ask what happened around birth? If they came out having a hard time breathing or if parents say something like, oh, they've been having a hard time since, you know, one week of life, that kind of is weird. I mean, that not a lot of asthmatics do that, okay? Um, and so the other thing that is sort of a social thing that it gives me is how a parent views their baby's first couple of year, year or even that first entry into life really tells you a lot about how they view their child, right? Um, how frequently are their illnesses? Are they really going to the urgent care, ER, getting a lot of steroids? Obviously evidence of atopic disease. And then recurrent bacterial infections. I don't get excited about a family who says, oh, you know, they get out viruses all the time. I'm like, they get viruses and the only thing that gets it makes it better is to get azithro augment and amoxicillin and then the steroids don't matter. OK, that's weird. Um, and then the other thing is persistency of respiratory symptoms, even when well. So uh, the question I ask families are, do they have nasal congestion every day? Can you think of a single day where they do not sound stuffy? They do not have nasal congestion. Or um, I ask them like, if you put them in a crowd, can you pick them out because they're coughing, wheezing? You can hear them coughing when they're in the hallway in the school. Um, or, and then clarifying again, what's noisy breathing? What's wheezing? 
And then the other important things are if there's growth issues and belly issues. Those really I start paying more attention to. So after I kind of get my history and physical exam, I start thinking about what are things that might be making things worse for this child, right? So then we talk about things that are easy to what I call hard. Uh, so optimizing treatment, reviewing inhaler technique, making sure they're actually taking their medicines, clarifying their asthma action plans, and then assessing their environment, air quality, tobacco, vape smoke, and then treating comorbidities and risk factors. And then it gets really hard things are like, talking to them about exercise, talking to them about losing weight, talking them to them about adhering to mucus clearance, and then all that psychosocial stuff. So what are the comorbidities that can affect asthma? So I broke this into a couple of different slides because I sort of think of them in, in categories, okay? So I think about medical comorbidities and within medical comorbidities, I break this down into parts of the body. So number one, the upper airway up here. So, you know, is it rhinitis? Is it allergic rhinitis? Is it non-allergic rhinitis that's leading to cough? Is there gastroesophageal reflux leading to cough? Is there sinusitis, ear issues that's maybe stimulating an Arnold's nerve? Is there vocal cord dysfunction? Is there sleep apnea? From a lower airway, I start thinking about parenchymal disease processes like um, bronchiectasis, recurrent pneumonias. Is there airway malacia? Is the tube itself floppy and noisy? Um, and then from a GI standpoint, I think about eosinophilic esophagitis, reflux, and then of course the big other of obesity and how that can um, affect asthma. From a psychosocial comorbidities, I break them down into two different categories. I go intrinsic and extrinsic. And from intrinsic, we think about all those things like anxiety, depression, psychiatric disorders, oppositional defiant disorder, making it hard to adhere to an asthma regimen because they just don't want to do it. Or um, the kids with ADHD, it's not that they, they, they believe it works, they think it works, it's just that they can't remember to do it or their family is so distracted because there's so many other things going on. I added in autism sensory processing disorders, um, sort of as a group. Um, and I think about this because, you know, even just like I think two weeks ago, I had a young lady who had been falling for three years who we've been kind of titrating up and down her and her inhaled steroids for these vague complaints of, of abnormal sensations and dyspnea. Um, and then finally, mom came to me and said, you know, I think, um, you know, she just got diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder and she actually has a sensory issue and that may be part of our problem um, or developmental delays because they can't communicate with us us, how they feel and what's going on, and that may complicate um, how we manage their asthma. And we think about um, extrinsic issues, right? So their environment, uh, what's their air quality like? Um, this is a nice little diagram from a study um, in China discussing about how air pollution has actually increased the number of asthmatics that are out there um, or children with asthma out there. Linking the idea of health to poverty. This is a study from Pittsburgh um, that indicates that the poorer you are, guess what? Um, the more the more asthma you've got. Um, and then adverse childhood experiences, we've, we, you know, this in itself could be a whole 45 minute talk for me. So uh, the idea that the more adverse childhood experiences there are, the higher the risk and prevalence of asthma in this group of kids. Um, and there's actually very interesting studies that show that if you have lots of ACEs and you live in an environment that's not very good, you even more increase the likelihood of asthma, asthma exacerbations and cough. And then finally, parental psychology and philosophy. So this one I think is, is a difficult one to navigate as pediatricians because you have to think about how does that parent view their child, but also what is their philosophy in life? And, and it can go both ways. You can have parents who are just tough it out, you're gonna be good, and the other parent on the other side who's using all butyrol 15 times a day because anytime their kid has a little problem, they pull it out and use it. And then finally, familial culture, the ways of life, right? So there are interesting studies that talk about how much asthma that occur in, in, in cultures where there's indoor burning um, or indoor uses of uh, where they burn things for fuel and kitchen supplies, right? Or incense, you know, so that's another really interesting one. How do you navigate that? 
Um, so always knowing when to ask for help. Uh, so these are a list of different specialties. Once you've identified those comorbidities and risk factors, um, knowing who to talk to. And so a couple of differential diagnoses when you think, okay, now I'm kind of identified there's these things here. I think this is probably asthma, but let's review and make sure that, you know, I'm not missing something else. Okay, so again, I break these down in categories for you. So big category, I think you have to consider, which can coexist with severe asthma is dysfunctional breathing, such as vocal cord dysfunction, or what we now are termed inducible laryngeal obstruction, in order to include the category of exercise-induced laryngeal malacia, for instance, anxiety, panic attacks. Your anatomic um, causes, such as your tracheal bronchomalacia um, or a mediastinal mass, for instance, could easily be um, causing recurrent wheeze. Then to your superative lung diseases such as cystic fibrosis, primary ciliary dyskinesia, which can present as a kid with recurrent respiratory infections, or bronchiectasis or protracted bacterial bronchi bronchitis, which can present as a kid who has persistent cough that's wet. Um, your diffuse or interstitial lung diseases, I included bronchiolitis obliterans. And then I think a big category that we all have to deal with more than any, more now than ever before, is bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which falls under diffuse lung diseases as an alveolar growth disorder. Um, and then finally, on the two bottom rows are, are others, your aspiration, your chronic salivary aspiration kids, um, your immune dysfunction kids, your connective tissue disease kids. So when we think about diagnostic testing, we're talking about what's rolling up and rolling down. And so here's a really simple list, but essentially things to consider your labs, CBC, looking for absolute bloody eosinophils, your sputum evaluation, your immunoglobulins, your inflammatory markers, your pulmonary function testing, which we'll discuss more, um, using spirometry, methylcholine challenge, exercise, and then imaging scopes, laryngoscopy, looking just at the larynx, or bronchoscopy going all the way down into the lung, and then skin prick testing as part of your workup. So let's go right into diagnostic testing. So sometimes it is super easy to confirm the diagnosis of asthma, right? So this is a 13-year-old boy that I see in my clinic. He has severe asthma. He's been in the ED 19 times in the year before I saw him in air clinic. Um, his fractional exhaled nitric oxide when he walked through the door was 81. Um, you could see that uh, he had a great forced expiratory time, hit beyond the six-second mark right here at 8.94. His FEV1 was 48%. His FEV1 over FEC was, um, uh, oh, I just realized, do you guys actually see, there we go. His FEV1 over FEC was 56.83%, so he's very obstructed, and he had a 49% change. So in a case like this, it's obstructed, he's inflammatory, he's reversible, easy peasy. Now, sometimes it's not so easy, though. So this is a six-year-old girl with uncontrolled severe asthma, was on Simbacort 80, um, was not responsive, mother felt like, had recurrent noisy breathing, wheezing. Her first test looked like this. And so, you know, at the age of six, oftentimes we kind of give them a, eh, this is probably bad technique, right? And you see a couple of things here. So number one, her forced expiratory time was less than three seconds, which is what we want at a six-year-old. And so, okay, so FET wasn't that great. You can see that he, she kind of starts to hit plateau right here on this volume loop. And then she's got this wonky looking exhalation, right? This it's kind of like eh, boom just drop off but when you look at the numbers themselves if you were to let the machine read this this would be considered normal okay so what we want to see is what are the other loops look like and when you can see that the other loops all do the exact same thing whoop blunt womp okay just falls right down. When you see something like this, you've got to be concerned about potentially a compression of some kind. And so when we got the CT scan, let's see if this will, if this will, hopefully this will play. There we go. So she has a vascular ring. This is a right aortic arch with an aberrant left subclavian. So you can see how it wraps all the way around. There was mild narrowing of the trachea right at the level of the diverticulum of Comorel. Um, and so that was the reason for her PFTs. 
Other possible diagnostic testing option include methacholine. So this is an 11 year old um, that I saw, uh, 11 year old young lady. Um, her mother was a nurse, I recall. She came to me for a second opinion, had seen an outside um, allergist, was on Symbacort 80, um, all sorts of stuff, felt like it really wasn't making a big difference. Atrovent and albuterol PRN. Mother insists that even though her allergy testing came back very low level positive. She really wasn't triggered by allergies. It was always viral. Her initial PFT showed moderate obstruction with a very minimal bronchodilator response and her pheno was five. So, you know, really the question mother had for me was, is this even asthma? Um, and so we did a methacholine challenge. And so a couple of things um, to note here is this is her, her first baseline, and you can see that even at baseline, um, she had an FEV1 uh, that was 67%, and then here was her first saline dose, her first methacholine, second methacholine, nothing exciting, third methacholine, nothing exciting, no significant change still, in fact, bumped up 3%, and then fourth methacholine dose, she drops by 11%. Now, according to our protocol, you have to hit 20 for it to be significant. So the, P, um, the PFT lab went ahead and gave her her last and final dose, and she dropped by 58% and went down to 28% on her FEV1 and was a significant response. So it definitely has asthma. Now, for those of you who work at Children's Mercy, you'll see that our methacholine um, um, paper, like a uh, PDF file of the report, sorry, the report has changed. And so what we are now using instead of just 20% as a change for positivity is we're using something called the pre-D20, which is our provocation dose that leads to a decline in 20% um, in of the FEV1. So this is another little girl. She's a 13 year old uh, on smart therapy, um, singular, really poor response overall because of side effects and things. And honestly, mother said, you know, I, I just want to know because I'm tired of fighting with her about her asthma meds and I just want to know if she even has asthma. I said, okay, fine, we'll just do a methacholine then. Again, same thing you can see on this dose of methacholine, she almost hits that 2014.8 and by the, the next at the four uh, concentration, you see that it hits, she hits at negative 27%. So how you read this is you get a PD 20, and then you look over here on the micrograms at 75. So she does have mild airway hyperreactivity. Another thing here, here's another um, example of another methacholine challenge. Here's a 12 year old girl. She was seeing me for a third opinion at this point, um, had been seen by an outside hospital allergist, private allergist, Dad was a doctor, so saw one of dad's friends who was an adult allergist and then went to St. Louis for a GI evaluation because she was having these recurrent abdominal pains, globus sensation, um, recurrent nasal congestion, and recurrent cough. And, what, and those were all little things that kind of hit me as weird, right? So she kept saying, like, you know, it's like I keep doing this <clears throat> thing. Hmm. And I feel like there's something here. Um, and again, that was kind of strange to me. So I have to be honest with you. I wasn't really sure she actually had asthma. So her skin testing was negative, all the things, right? So she came in, she had her saline and pretty much this was her first dose of methacholine. She dropped to 28%. And I asked the RT, why did you keep going in light of the fact that she dropped initially so quickly? And the Archie said, I just wasn't sure it was real. <laughs> so she gave her a second dose of methacholine, which she dropped by 40%. Uh, she had a 40% change. So this was marked airway hyper responsiveness. Um, the other thing that was really nice about this methacholine challenge was it showed me a couple of other things about her. So here's a base. Here's the first one. And it was labeled base two, but this is these are actually doses. Um, so here's her base. This is sorry, this is saline. This is her first methacholine, and this is her second methacholine. And you can see there's a scoop on her expiratory limb already right here, an even bigger scoop here. And then after albuterol, she returns back to normal um, in regards to exhalation limb. But look at the inspiratory loops too. You see how they're kind of got this funky clipped shape to it? And then even 
most obvious right here on this one here. I kind of zoom this one in for you. Um, you can see how it's really clipped. So not only does she have a component of airway hyperreactivity, she also has a component of vocal cord dysfunction. Here's an exercise challenge. Um, this was a 13 year old girl. History was really limited. Um, you know, she was on smart therapy without any significant benefit. Uh, albuterol monoleucas with no significant benefit. Um, the mother was Spanish speaking. The child was just not very open or very good historian is probably a nice way of saying it. Um, and she complained of exercise and due shortness of breath. So we decided to do an exercise challenge on her. And what you can see is pretty nothing very very exciting, so a pretty normal test. Um, you, we have them run per our protocol and then measure at one minute, five minute, 10 minute, 15 minute, 20 minute, really no significant changes here. But when you actually review the loops, again, see the expiratory limb is not very exciting. There's a little bit of a blunting right here of that peak, but really the big thing you see here is this clipping of the inspiratory loop. And that's pretty concerning for a component of exercise-induced vocal cord dysfunction or exercise-induced laryngeal obstruction is the new name for it. Um, other possibilities for diagnostic workup is a chest CT scan. So as you can see, I'm running a theme here of how to undiagnose asthma or as or what I do in my clinic, I call asthma and. Uh, so for diagnostic testing, we do a chest CT scan. This was a three-year-old second opinion for severe asthma, again, seen by an outside hospital allergist, thought, you know, concerns of increased albuteronine. And the ding, ding things in the story for me was one, the kid was three and on Simbacort 160. Number two, mom's that this symptom started before the age of one, and there were concerns about difficulties gaining weight and choking. So all these things were made it really make sense to why the allergist said, hey, you need to see somebody else. Um, so physical exam was normal otherwise. I mean, kid was sitting there, looked good made the kid run up and down the hallway, and now all of a sudden you see these DSATs, you see this increased distress. His initial swallowing evaluation was concerning for dysphagia and penetrations, and so I actually asked for a CT scan um, for aspiration. And let's take a look at this. So this is an inspiratory view on this side, uh, and what you can see is these areas of normal lung, but as you go down, can you see how the attenuation here changes, right? When you're looking at the right middle lobe and the lingula, it's more gray all of a sudden, kind of up top. Now, if a kid is laying flat, the posterior lung bases should be more, um, have more grayness to them, okay? And then when you have them exhale, the whole lung should kind of get more gray. You shouldn't have areas of air trapping. And what you're seeing is there's definitely some areas of air kind of kind of lighter gray and, and some maybe some areas of air trapping here. But really, you see much more prominent this kind of up on the right middle lobe here and the lingula over here. And this kid actually had neuroendocrine hyperplasia of infancy. This is an interstitial lung disease process. Um, and it was likely that the dachypnea and the distress he was having was contributing to his dysphagia and his aspiration, and thereby leading to this disease that's posteriorly. But really, the source of his issues was the neuroendocrine hyperplasia of infancy. So now let's so um, this one's another one. This was a diagnostic, more examples of diagnostic tests. This is a seven-year-old boy with past medical history of refugee camp. Actually really interesting. Showed up in our ED, hypotensive, wheezing, um, treated with prednisone and albuterol, and pretty much the ER doctor was like, just go to pulmonary clinic. There, mom said that in the refugee camp, he got daily prednisone. He was on oral corticosteroids all the time for asthma. He had significant ADL limitations. On exam, he was in distress. He was wheezing. His first PFT ever with me, um, if you actually look, his forced expiratory time, again, 2.85. He never really hits plateau here. So if you look at the first one, you might think he just has restrictive lung disease because he has an FEV1 of 21%. His FEV1 over FEC is within normal. But once we post him, he finally almost gets to plateau here at 3.06 seconds. And you can see he has a 78% change after albuterol, and his FEV1 improves to 37%. 
So um, the ding ding things here again are why is this kid on this much oral steroids? Why is this kid have that severe amount of lung disease? Um, and so we asked for a chest CT scan. And what I want you to pay attention to here is yes, there are areas of air trapping where you're seeing light next to dark, but also notice that there's areas of bronchiectasis. You see these bigger, thicker airways with kind of thicker, wider rims. Um, you can kind of maybe see it a little bit on this one um, where you're seeing these areas of light and dark kind of uh, air trapping areas, but then these thick airways here. So this is bronchiolitis obliterans, um, post-infectious, okay? And I put some screenshots there to really see if you can, the bronchiectasis is there. So last and not least of the diagnostic, or maybe second to last, sorry, uh, the diagnostic type. Finally, other thoughts for genetic testing. So this one was a seven-year-old boy referred to Air Clinic. He was on Dulera 100. The ding-ding things here were, yes, he had a ton of atopic stuff. Um, but what was weird was he always had these watery loose stools, uh, mom said. So I got a sweat test on him, which was elevated at 39 and 40, but yet his pancreatic elastase was normal. Um, yeah, he still have all these GI symptoms. His genetic testing came back negative for cystic fibrosis, but he did have multiple variants in DNH5, which was for primary ciliary dyskinesia, which is an autosomal recessive disease, um, for CA12, which is an autosomal recessive, recessive for hyperchlorohydrosis, but came back with one variant that was positive for SCNN1A, which is uh, attributed to bronchiectasis as well as elevated sweat test. And that is an autosomal dominant um, disease process. So referrals, this is the um, five-year-old child that I saw with viral-induced wheezing. And the thing that really stood out on our first visit was mom said, I'm not sure albuterol helps. And I don't think he's ever really wheezed. He just has this diagnosis of viral-induced wheezing and refractory asthma. In fact, mom's really big thing was he keeps getting these right-sided pneumonias. So the question is, are these real pneumonias? Is this right middle lobe syndrome? Is there some bronchiectasis here? Is there a superative disease process here? And she insists that he really does need antibiotics. So we reviewed his chest x-rays and what you can see here is that even when well and his exam was normal, there's this right-sided infiltrate on um, the films. And so this led to further diagnostic workup. Um, and, and, and the big thing that stood out was that he had a really low IgA. This child um, I sent to immunology. Um, we also did a further ENT and CT evaluation. What are other possible ways to do diagnostic testing? We talk about flexible bronchoscopy. So there's really not a lot of reasons for bronchoscopy in my mind, but the biggest things for asthma is really phenotyping. So knowing what the cell count is, knowing how eosinophilic they are, neutrophilic they are, maybe if that helps you decide if they're posse immune, kind of figure out if there's an anatomical process, like is there airway malacia, and then obviously to rule out infection, aspiration, and foreign body. The biggest con to flexible bronchoscopy is that it re requires an evaluation in the operating room. Um, it is though very helpful in certain cases. So this one here is an example of a 15 year old girl. She has a history of trisomy 21 on Dulera. Um, she had fatigue with exercise and some response with albuterol, but her PFTs were really unreliable. It took me a little while, but we finally got her into the flex uh, to get a flexible bronchoscopy. And what you see here is what we call some fish mouthing of the trachea. You see how it kind of has this flattened area and the posterior membrane is rising up to meet it. So this was pretty good tracheal malacia. I could, um, I don't have the actual image of where she actually completely collapsed on top of me because it was really hard to take a photo of that moment but this was the moment before her whole airway just collapsed down but the other thing is you'll see is that there's sort of this widening of the spaces and the posterior membrane kind of rises up to come to meet the top uh, and this i think is a nice segue into thinking about cellular phenotyping for asthma so one of the first things you should know is that 
the cell count differential on blood and BAL are different. Okay, so in blood, the predominant amount of white blood cells is neutrophils. In BAL or in a bronchoalveolar lavage, the predominant amount of cell, um, cells is actually alveolar macrophages. And that kind of makes sense because the lung is one of the places where germs go through, right? Your GI tract, your nose, your lung, your air, anything that air hits, that's that's what encounters the outside world. Um, and generally speaking, there's a lot more macrophages there to help clean up. Um, and then not that often neutrophils, some lymphocytes, and very rarely do you see eosinophils. And so this is a, a good segue into the idea of phenotyping, I think. Um, and when we think about asthma now, um, oftentimes you'll hear the TH2 high and TH2 low or eosinophilic or non-eosinophilic, okay? Um, this is a nice little diagram to kind of review the thoughts about different types of asthma. Um, and in this top, um, I guess, wedge here, you can see what's normal, healthy, thin airway smooth airway smooth muscle, um, thin reticular basement membrane, and intact epithelium. Um, the, and then on this side, we'll go through eosinophilic asthma for TH2 high. And in this wedge, we have one of our more well-described types of asthma, allergic asthma or allergic eosinophilic inflammation. You see the triggers of allergies. This is activating this whole TH2 group here. You see thicker, smooth muscles. You see more eosinophils. You see activation of IgE. You see breakdown of the epithelium, increased mucus production. And then a non-allergic eosinophilic inflammation over here with activation of the innate lymphoid cell 2. And then over here, there's mixed granulocytic, but you have neutrophilic group here, which um, we, we categorize in this TH2 low group. Um, and again, this is activated by pollutants, oxidative stress, and microbes. And then posse is the kind of weird one, which is there's not, we're not really sure what the inflammatory process is here. So just quick, some quick definitions, type two, to be or not to be. Um, so for type two, uh, this, is, uh, this is the uh, where there's elevated blood eosinophils, there's elevated fractional exhal nitric oxide, there's elevated sputum eosinophils, and the cytokines that we really talk about are IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. Um, and this is a quick def, you know, for the sake of time, I won't go through all this, but it's a qu some quick definitions of what all of these different um, cytokines do. And then the type of inflammation. Um, type 2 inflammation means essentially that there's one or more of these, and you generally in a patient see higher IgE levels, higher eosinophils, higher pheno. Okay. Um, so type 2 eosinophilic information is, uh, inflammation is more um, readily identified in preschool early age um, and has been described to be up to 50% of the cases of mild to moderate persistent. They're described to have worse control, worse uh, lung function, worse airway hyperresponsiveness, and worse exacerbations. The good boon of it is, is that they're thought to be more corticosteroid responsive, even though there's a subset that has no, uh, that don't have or does not have as much of a response response to ICS. Um, for TH2 low, we think about neutrophilic airway inflammation, and this is a group um, that has been associated in the past with poor response to steroids, an unclear cause. They think maybe in adults it has to do with more smoking, or maybe in children it's more viruses, and there are varying reports in the studies of asthma with what the BAL findings are, but the thought process is it's just TH1 and TH17 uh, lymphocyte-mediated process. In this group of patients, you know, we think about them as limited eosinophilic, they're non-atopic, and they have these other kind of exposures, environmental tobacco smoke reflux. And this is kind of a complicated idea because so what neutrophils do is they travel to the airway surface and then they release these enzymes and these enzymes break down the epithelium, increase the airway smooth muscle, cause more hypertrophy, mucus gland hypertrophy. Um, and the relationship and dynamic between steroids and neutrophils kind of conf in, a little bit interesting and, and questionably in conflict because, for instance, uh, the recruitment of neutrophils is facilitated by these Th17 cells, but the cytokines that activate those, they seem to be insensitive. And the other thing is we know that steroids increase the number of neutrophils in blood, so what does it really mean if you have neutrophilic asthma and you're on high doses of inhaled corticosteroid or repeated courses of oral steroids? 
Um, and then the other group is posse immune asthma. So these are uh, patients who have these intrinsic alterations in the cell function itself, whether that be epithelium, smooth muscle, vessels, or nerves. And when they take the smooth muscles out of deceased patients, um, who we think have posse immune asthma, they notice that they grew faster uh, with growth, uh, to growth factors, they were more air, they were more responsive, um, and also again, kind of a question mark. They seem to be insensitive to steroids um, on the plate, at least. Um, so this is a uh, kind of a nice kind of summary graphic um, from a recent paper that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, and they always produce these beautiful graphics that. Um, kind of combine everything there, right? So um, in the last couple minutes, we'll uh, kind of try to go through biologics uh, real quickly. I know that you guys are going to have many more talks, uh, so I'll just kind of briefly touch upon that as treatment. Um, so we'll break this down into TH2 and then TH2 high and TH2 low. And so for TH2 high biologic therapies, what we have available are Zoller, Nucala, Syncare, Dupixent, and Fizenra. I won't review Syncare because that's really outside of my spectrum because I don't do adults. Um, but uh, when we think about Zoller, what Zoller is specifically is an anti-IgE. So we have to show um, allergic sensitization. So really when I think about Zoller, I think about atopic asthmatics. Um, it has shown improvement in exacerbation quality of life. The biggest thing that's the negative is the black box warning for anaphylaxis. When we think about the next group is we talk about the anti-IL-5s. And so right here for mepolizumab, rezolizumab is Syncare. Um, and so what anti-IL-5 do is it decreases both blood and sputum eosinophils. Um, and really it's uh, when you target those that are really eosinophilic, there was a good number of reduction um, in exacerbations. And so here's mepolizumab acting here as well as acting here from bone marrow to blood vessel. And then Dupixent uh, has also uh, come out is for to be used at home, and this is an IL-4 receptor alpha. The nice thing about this is it essentially inhibits both IL-4 and IL-13 signaling because it affects the receptor itself. Um, I've been using it more often, especially in our severe eosinophilic asthmatics uh, with atopic dermatitis because of the ability to do it at home. Um, and has been shown to improve quality of life and exacerbations. So for Fazenra, this is for over the age of 12 mainly, and you note that they also come in a pen format and can be done at home. Um, and this is an anti-IL-4, I mean IL-5 receptor antibody. So really it um, its main mechanism of action is for eosinophilic asthma, and um, it essentially causes cytotoxicity. For those that are mixed, um, the low and mixed therapy. So this is the other side of that graphic here. So for those with TH2 low, which are neutrophilic dominant here with this TH1 and TH17 pathway, there are a couple of things that you can think about adding in. Uh, make the caveat that for anticholinergics, azithromycin and tizomilipamab, um, you can use it in some of the cases for the TH2 high too. Um, and it is advocated as such in the guidelines. Um, so for anticholinergics, we think about uh, effects on the muscarinic receptors on the smooth muscle. For azithromycin, we're thinking about anti-inflammatory processes up here. Um, and then for tezapilumab or tespire, uh, that's our anti-TSLP. Um, I will tell you frankly that I am a big fan of anticholinergics um, and um, unabashedly so. Um, and so for the long acting anticholinergics, we have pretty much teotropium, which comes in two formats, Spireva um, Respimat and Spireva Handy Haler. This has been approved by the um, FDA for those over the age of six. And um, both the EPR4 um, updates as well as Gina recommend that you should add it on um, after you've increased somebody to an ICS-LABA, ideally, um, 
for both of those groups. I would say the biggest thing between this one and this one is that this is a dry powder. Also, there's technically um, a lactose component to it for those who have milk allergy, I believe. Um, I'm not sure how much it actually triggers them, but I've had a couple of parents complain, so I usually move them to a rest of that. Um, another option for llama, and this is really for those that are 18 and above, though I have been able to get Medicaid to pay for a couple for 16 year olds, and this would be Trilogy. Um, and so the llama in here is the Eumeclidium. Um, and the nice thing about Trilogy is it's a one puff once a day option. Um, and I've had a few uh, kids really just buy into this. They really like it. Uh, the biggest things are dry. It's a dry powder. Um, there are age restrictions and then dry mouth symptoms. It's use. Uh, you can have the 100 or the 200 if you're using it for asthma. If you're using it for COPD, um, the 100 is indicated. For antimicrobials, and this one, conflict abounds. So do you do it as a Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Do you do it at onset of illness? What's the dose? So the big thing is we will generally use is azithromycin in uh, children, um, and it's an anti-inflammatory antibiotic. You can consider use for it in neutrophilic asthmatics. There's some studies that show uh, for preschool wheezers, um, they have higher neutrophil counts. They have higher rates of bacteria and bronchalveolar lavage. There's one study um, that used azithromycin early um, at onset of an upper respiratory infection, reduced the likelihood of a severe lower respiratory tract infection. So there's some data that supports this use, right? Now, the 2014 ERSATS guidelines on severe asthma essentially recommended against routine use in children. Um, in GINA, they said, well, you could try it if there's no evidence of type 2 inflammation or if a biologic therapy isn't working, isn't available or just not working for a patient. Um, and the way I like to use it, I, I've actually used it in a bunch of different ways for my neutrophilic asthmatics. Some, some of them, um, I try to use it Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The biggest issue with using it Monday, Wednesday, Friday is getting insurance to cover it, getting the amount of pills for it, um, and then the other way I really like to use it is right at onset of a yellow zone. Um, <clears throat> for the last uh, to cover for biologics is the most recent one that's come out and it's Tezpar. This is an anti-TSLP. Um, it's every four weeks. It's a pre-filled syringe. Um, the nice thing about this is that it has no phenotype or biomarker. And uh, the thought process was that it uh, by blocking TSLP, you actually block here, here, and here. Um, and so therefore, you can kind of navigate between t type 2 and high and type 2 low. Um, has been shown to reduce exacerbation, improve FEV1 quality of life. Um, and then in those with eosinophilic inflammation has shown decreased pheno as well as blood eos. Um, and it does have some side effects of arthralgia and um, pharyngitis. And then last... Um, would be bronchial thermoplasty. This was this is mainly in adults. It's a series of three bronchoscopies. You essentially um, navigate the scope into the airways, and then you uh, submit an electric current to sort of, um, I guess, for lack of a better word, uh, burn um, the airways down, or maybe apply excessive heat to the airways. Um, and right now it is not approved for children. We do not have that modality for children. There has been some success in adults. The EPR4 essentially says that they do not recommend it. And Gina says, well, you can think about it in the really uncontrolled. So how do you choose? Well, there's a couple of algorithms out there. Um, this is a nice, simple one from a practical approach to severe asthma out of the ATS. Um, there's a more in-depth one, which I really like from the severe asthma pocket guide. And then this is from the new gem article that we kind of talked, we sh I showed you the picture of what I really like about this is it has a kind of nice um, breakdown here of like, well, what type of phenos and how much EOs? Um, and that's how you can pick which biologic. Now, the problem with all of that is of course, of course, in real life, uh, we sort of pick whatever Missouri Medicaid and Kansas Medicaid says we can do. Uh, but it's nice to think about this, right? So, um, so that leads us kind of nicely into the issue with control. Um, and so really the issue with control and severe asthma can be kind of broken down to a number of different factors. So number one is intrinsic factors is this kid just has bad asthma. 
OK, just this is the, the underlying severity of their disease process, the insensitivity that they have to corticosteroids. The extrinsic factors are all the things that are so hard to control because they're outside of your office. Um, their adherence, um, I had uh, their supervision, and I have the fatalistic nature for some of these kids who have significant anxiety and depression. Uh, I had one girl once tell me, it'll never get better, I'll just die this way, like my auntie died. Um, the complexity of their treatment regimens, um, not just what you do, but what everybody else gives them. If you if they end up having reflux, they have to go this person and they have the and then this person, um, you know, how much this whole thing is costing um, the things that are going on in their home. And then the ugly one, which is secondary gain, like what, what do they gain from having asthma this bad? Is there something like that that might be happening in the family? And how do you approach that and have that conversation with families? Um, and then finally, the th other kind of an in another intrinsic factor is just really being one armed by insurance. I mean, um, you know, I always think to myself, what would I pick if I lived in no insurance land? Um, and for those of you who haven't been introduced to Dr. Glockham uh, feel free to watch this lovely video on how insurance works. It always gets makes me chuckle a bit. Um, kind of sadly chuckle but <laughs> so in summary um so the first thing uh for the evaluation of severe asthma is you have to confirm is this really asthma um the next step is really that it's necessary for you to evaluate what are their risk factors what are their comorbidities and what is their phenotype um, the emerging thing therapies that we have now um, aim to control not only asthma symptoms, decrease exacerbations, but also provide steroid sparing side effects. And that's really important because, again, remember that our severe persistent asthmatics or our severe refractory asthmatics sometimes have relative corticosteroid sense, you know, insensitivity. So really, you know, what are you doing? Continuing to give them high doses of steroids. Um, and then finally, the ideal world of treatment of severe asthma is moving towards precision medicine, but the real life treatment of severe asthma means we make non-ideal evaluations and non-ideal treatments. And here's a couple of um, suggested readings and references are within the notes of each slide. And so I think we have exactly four minutes for questions. Fantastic, all right, let's <laughs> open it up to the group for questions. So one of the things I say frequently, if treatment's not working, you always have to rethink either you have the wrong treatment or you might have the wrong diagnosis. And I think a lot of your talk kind of focused on that because uh, there are many things that can, uh, that are lookalikes. Um, mm -hmm. I think another thing to be important too, from the social aspect, when you're working with your patients, if they've been told they've had asthma for five years and they've spent thousands and thousands of dollars in endless visits here, walk gingerly into it and say, I am concerned about your asthma, but I'm also concerned there might be a complicating factor, so. Absolutely, that has definitely, that first moment where you're like, eh, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, a lot of times since the continuity of care is so broken in our healthcare system, they're seeing you for the first time. So are they gonna trust their primary care who they've followed for 10 years? Or are they gonna trust you? So um, just remember to walk into that carefully. Yeah, I think the best thing about being an ambulatory care provider is I can all, I always know that I can always see you back again. So my first visit, I agree with you completely, Chris, is about establishing like, hey, we're, this is our first date. Let's see where it goes. Come right. back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I'm not seeing anything from the rest of the crowd, so. Must have been fantastically and well received. <laughs> so, Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Yeah, we, we appreciate you being here. Hope I can count on you in the future. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Bye. All right. Bye. So this will conclude uh, conferences online and allergy today. Uh, we'll see everybody back on Friday. Thank you.